one big uh, item on the agenda, and that is event networking. When you are at an event like today, there is Wi-Fi. It is awfully fast, uh, at least it should be. There's IPv6 and everything. This is all arranged by event infra. Um, if you go to a RIPE meeting, there is a RIPE meeting network, and it also works very, very well. Now, and if you ever visited Cisco Live, well, that's also something. Actually, it was Andre from the RIPE NCC who first uh, talked to us and said, hey, I may want to present something about the RIPE meeting network. And then we thought, hey, but that's nice because we also have a meeting network. So let's have Arjan present as well. And then, yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, uh, two is, a, is, is not large enough crowd yet. So we also asked Andrew, who worked for Cisco, to tell us a little bit about what he does with event networking. So the idea is as follows. Each of the three guys will present for about 15 minutes about their event network. And then all three will join us again on stage for a panel discussion where you can ask about your event networks and discuss pros and cons among them uh, about how they do their event networking and what they should or could have learned from each other. I don't know. Uh, first on the agenda is Andre. So I would say take it away and tell us about the RIPE Meeting Network. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, this is me. My name is Andre Zaletka. I work for RIPE NCC, and uh, we have this uh, meeting uh, that we are organizing for our community called RIPE Meeting every uh, six months. The next one is actually next week in Prague. Uh, so you are all welcome, unless if you are not uh, registered yet. Uh, there are about 600 people on such an event, if you were not there yet. Uh, but I recognize lots of familiar faces here, so I guess uh, I don't have to go through this uh, uh, too, uh, too much. Uh, the thing is, we bring our network there, and it's a, uh, so we do it in a way that we have our own AS number, 2121, and uh, our own uh, bunch of IPv4 addresses. Well, bunch, let's say we are quite rich regarding this uh, in today's prices. And also, also an, um, uh, of course, IPv6 uh, prefix. And we basically bring the network to the location, connect it to local uh, connectivity sponsor, and start announcing it. So it's like a real ISP, except that it moves every six months to different location. And with that, we have some issues observed, and you probably were observing it as well. The first thing is geolocation, because yeah, internet is not just internet. It's always like uh, services are interested in where you are located. Uh, there are two basic types of geolocation. The first one is like BSS ID or MAC address of the access point based geolocation. And this was something that like was a big issue back in like 10 years ago, and it sort of disappeared. So uh, I guess uh, Google and Apple made something, made some changes in their, in their system, or maybe they just uh, removed our network from it. But I have this uh, interesting uh, map from my Google location history where I made it in one hour from Amsterdam to Warsaw to Athens in 2014, so this is how you did, because somehow my phone was trusting the most, the MAC address of the access point that is connected was the, was the uh, highest uh, probability geolocation source. Uh, yeah, and of, usually in the venues you don't have GPS to get, the, get some uh, other data. The other thing is IP-based geolocation. This is much more prevalent because uh, BSSID-based uh, geolocation is only, you know, this is only accessible to um, people like Google or Apple, maybe Microsoft, who are taking care of the devices, but uh, every service provider out there who is showing advertisements to you needs to know where you are because they can, they can adver uh, target advertisements, and for that they need the geolocation, they use this IP-based geolocation. The problem is that there is no one geolocation, it's just like privately created lists of different commercial providers that are creating their own list and selling it to people. Uh, so uh, we, uh, together with uh, 
IATF network operators and also other similar events uh, have established some deal with Google and we are publishing a CSV list uh, in Google saying these IP addresses are in this location now. And this CSV list uh, became later RFC 8805. So now it's like the standardized way of uh, publishing um, GeoFeed, uh, which we do as well. We just still, the file is still called google.csv because, but it's just like RFC 8805 uh, standard. Uh, it works uh, with this becoming a standard. Uh, the geolocation provider started to consuming these files much more uh, often, but we still have to tell them. So um, there is also another RFC saying that you can discover it using who is, where you basically put in your RIPE database. For instance, you put the uh, attribute with the with the link to this uh, RF uh, to this list. Uh, this uh, does not really work, at least we haven't found it. So what we have instead is that we have a list of seven geolocation provider and between each RIPE meeting we email all of them saying, hey, our network is now going to be in Prague. Can you please update your database that this address range is now in Prague? And by the way, we are publishing this feed, so if you, might, if you would like to consume it, it would be great. And uh, out of the seven, five are already consuming the feed, so in theory we don't have to t ask them again. We just still poke them, hey, make sure to read it again. Um, but uh, two of them are still like processing our manual updates every six months, so that's a little bit sad story. Uh, how the network looks like? Well, it's made to be a portable, so we are, uh, and we ended up over the years, uh, the network was uh, changing a lot, but the current state is basically that we are running everything layer from layer three above is virtualized in a Linux host that is running inside uh, VMware uh, on a super micro super uh, super server, which is those small black boxes on top of that rack uh, on the picture. Just quite uh, nice and small boxes that you can carry even in your carry-on luggage if it's necessary. So that's quite handy. And then uh, the other networking gear we have, we have basically switches and we only use them as a, as a, as a layer two devices. We have some Junipers, uh, we have some small Zyxels, which is that you might see lying around if we need to um, you know, put switches somewhere uh, in the middle of, of the uh, meeting room. And we have those core switches made by Microtik, which are this super cheap 10 gig uh, four port uh, switches. And then we have access points. We are using access points from Ubiquiti, Unify, uh, access points uh, quite uh, old now. I think it was 2017, most of them were bought. So uh, there are, uh, they are supporting only 801.11ac, uh, and yeah, hopefully we will uh, replace them uh, to something newer, but in the end, yeah, like not a big deal. This is how we tested them, and. Uh, the COVID break uh, was over and we was not sure whether it still works after two years being uh, stored in the storage. So we plugged all of them. So if you want more Wi-Fi, this is the most Wi-Fi you can get probably. It's like 50 access points. Uh, as I said, the whole uh, like infrastructure of the network is virtualized. It's running on Linux servers inside uh, VMware and uh, it's running open source. So we have routers running BERT, we have firewalls using NF tables, we have resolvers with node resolver or bind, uh, we have load balancers, we have DHCP service Kia, we have NAT64, Joule, and we have stats using CollectD, InfluxDB, Grafana, and everything is deployed using Ansible. So basically, most open source software we, uh, uh, that is for network we use just like that's the simplest way possible, let's say. This is how the logical network topology looks like. There's not a big surprise. On the right-hand side, there's the host network. We have two routers. Then we have some kind of backbone network where the NAT64 lives. And there's firewall, which is also like default gateway for all the networks. In the end, it's like eight different networks that we are uh, serving in play. Not, so it's not only the public network that you connect to, which is on that access points, but also like 
uh, various service networks with different firewall rules. And there's also this a little bit over-engineered DNS uh, resolver cluster, which I really like the way it works because there's just one segment with four resolvers and two load balancers. The load balancers are working in the direct routing mode, so basically they are only bouncing the incoming traffic to one of the workers, and then the worker is talking directly, directly uh, the other way without reaching through load balancers. That's quite interesting setup. Uh, also, another interesting thing about this network is that we, since uh, RIPE 85, uh, we are running a main network as something called IPv6 mostly. What is that? It's basically a dual stack network. Well, first of all, I talked about this at uh, this particular event two years ago, so maybe you remember. Uh, yeah, it's uh, basically a dual stack network that also supports NAT64, DNS64, PREF64, that means the devices don't have to use necessary IPE4 if they don't need to, and uh, they don't. Actually, 70% of devices are running V6 only on our network and not using V4, and only the last 30%, let's say, uh, are still running V4, and for them we provide V4, but we provide much less of it. Uh, the thing is, it requires perfectly working IPv6 as well as uh, NAT64, DNS64, so this might be a bit uh, challenging because in normal dual stack network you see that all the problems with V6 are just masked by happy eyeballs. With this, let me show you some issues that we have with NAT64. Uh, so we use the well-known NAT64 prefix and we use pool of 256 addresses. Everything works except that some VOD platform like NOSNL or IVC, EVC line says that uh, just uh, uh, the, the video doesn't play, everything works. And the browser console says 403 forbidden when the data should be coming. So we see from the network engineer perspective, this is application layer issue, so just, <laughs> if there is 403 error, then we don't care. <laughs> yeah. Well, we do care because we want our eyeballs to be happy, and uh, so we have to figure out what's the issue here. The issue is that this is how the video on demand platform usually works. First, your client is uh, getting some token from some token server, and then with the token, you go to the CDN server for actual video data. And with some platforms, like NOSNL, the uh, token is actually tied to your IPv4 address that you are talking to your uh, to, the, to the server, which requires you not to change your IPv4 address between talking to the token server and talking to the CDN server, which unfortunately is something that happens by default with Joule, because it just hashes destination IP address and destination port and source IP address in order to figure out which, uh, which uh, IP4 address from the pool will be taken. Fortunately, this can be fixed by a global option called FARC, so this is how we fix this issue. I also complained in the, in the mailing list, and the author uh, came with this uh, Andrzej Zaletka hashing algorithm, which I really like, that's why I put it here, which basically is, uh, a way where the, the IP4 address will get sticky and stay the same for, for one host, so the, this should prevent this thing. Unfortunately, this thing was not me, uh, uh, merged in the, in, the, uh, yeah, in the production, so uh, it's still in the branch and it's not uh, part of the Joule. So if you are deploying Joule as NAT64, you probably have to tweak the FARCs to fix the issues with NOS. Another part, yeah, I'm already quite long, but uh, another thing that I would like to point here is that uh, setting up Linux router for IPv6 made me uh, go and read RFC 4861 about IPv6 neighbor advertisement, which I uh, didn't really need before because it's just like ARP except for IPv6 and it uses multicast and the most issue with it are issues with multicast. But then I figured out that in neighbor advertisement, there's this flag called R, which is set when the neighbor is actually a router, and it's not set when the neighbor is not a router. And this is used uh, for detection whether the router changes their role to host. And what happens? So you just set up a new network. It works nicely. And then you attach your Linux host, and it works nicely. It works forever. And then you attach your Mac OS. It works nicely for six seconds and then it stops. 
and then it stops and the default gateway will disappear from your routing table. And then you reconnect to the, to the network and it works again for six seconds. Well, yeah, it turns out that six seconds is the time from receiving the root advertisement till the macOS will uh, go and check with neighbor, uh, neighbor uh, discovery whether the default gateway is still there. And if the default gateway re responds with R set to zero, let's say, oh, this is not a router anymore. Let's remove it from the routing table. So actually, macOS is doing the right thing, and Linux is just ignoring it. Um, the question is, what makes a Linux router respond with router flag set to zero? And it turned out this is the only and the only feature of the sysctl forwarding switch that is available on Linux per interface. So you have like net IPv6 conf ETH0 forwarding, and this doesn't do anything except for the R flag because the forwarding is global switch on the on Linux. So this is something that uh, we discovered. It was quite fun, and it was easy to fix, and now it's fixed in Network Manager, so it shouldn't happen anymore. Uh, but good to know, new thing to learn. Another new thing to learn is that, yeah, if you, run, if you used to run Network Manager and you had a full BGP feed in your routing table, Network Manager was eating the whole CPU just by processing all the Netlink messages. Uh, I was complaining about it at Raspberry meeting, and there was a guy in the audience saying, hey, we actually reported this to Red Hat because we are paying customers. And then Red Hat fixed it, and they fixed it for everybody, and now it's fixed, so no problem anymore. Uh, another issue is that if you run a, if you run a network that is, uh, like, uh, a network that is uh, like public, you will get those internet-wide scans. And if most of the IP4 addresses are not in use, they are still like, you know, somebody is probing them and they are just, it, it just creating ARP uh, messages asking whether there is somebody with that address. And the problem is that Linux doesn't have negative cache for this. So it's, uh, the network is like full of broadcast of ARP. And especially in Wi-Fi network, you really don't want broadcasts because broadcasts are like 1,000 times slower than unicasts. So even though the efficient bitrate here is like 84 kilobits, you can say that's nothing, the equivalent airtime is maybe 84 megabits, and that's something already like different. Uh, there's a solution to that, and that's part of IP row 2, which is the package every single Linux distribution has. Uh, RPD is a user space implementation of ARP that has negative cache and stores the, the ARP cache on disk. So if you run it, in case of uh, my empty network, when I tried it, uh, running IRPD will lower down the amount of broadcast uh, 30 times. I think that's worth running a simple utility. Uh, yeah, and the last thing I have here is about Wi-Fi. Uh, we use Unify. Uh, we are quite happy with it. It works nicely with V6, even though Unify is trying to prevent, uh, pretend that they don't know anything about it. Uh, we are running most of the SSIDs 5 gigahertz only. We have special legacy SSID that is 2.4 gigahertz, and we change name every single event. So uh, we, uh, in order to, in order to make people force, you know, uh, if they if they have configured the right network, it will stay and it will work al always. But if they uh, want to use 2.4 gigahertz, they have to configure it every time again. Uh, and there's a feature in Unify called multicast and broadcast control. And funny thing about this feature is that it kills IPv6 neighbor discovery protocol. So uh, we are using it as a sort of array guard. So if somebody wanted to uh, like break the network by sending router advertisements, they will just not be propagated by the means of this filtering. So it's a side effect of the feature that like, uh, uh, Unify probably didn't mention like this. And we have to allow list basically MAC addresses that are allowed to send neighbor discovery protocol, which have, be, have to be all the wired hosts. Uh, yeah, and uh, I lost the uh, numbers here, so you just see now nice pie charts without any annotations. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, but yeah, you can see that the, the, the big amount is five gigahertz on the first, on the first chart is the five gigahertz host, and the second chart is IPv6 only host, and that's everything from me. So uh, I think questions will be probably at the end of the... Yeah, we will do that at the end. So if you have questions for Andre, then please uh, uh, remember them until the panel uh, will be at this table. But if you have applause for Andre, you can do it now.
So then on the presentation laptop, we will quickly change to uh, Arjan's presentation. And that's, I think it should be just the next uh, slide. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, so one thing I noted about Andre's presentation was a lots of uh, servers that are involved in keeping this network running. And I know when Arjan and his team were here last night, there were no servers involved. No. So I'm curious, how do you do this? Okay. Just take it away. Okay. <laughs> hey, my name is Arjan, and uh, today I will uh, tell a little bit about uh, networking at uh, Hacker Festivals. Uh, for my day job, I'm working at uh, IGD.net, and uh, as a volunteer, I'm involved with the uh, organizations uh, Eventinfra and Bitlayer. This is the hackerspace in Amersfoort. And besides that, I am uh, also helping out in various event knocks, uh, such as uh, the hacker festival festivals I will talk about. And uh, as you can see, I like to climb things, but uh, <laughs> the story with the uh, Dixie will become a little bit more clear later on in the presentation. Uh, Eventifra uh, is a non-profit that supports um, various uh, non-profit slash community-run uh, events and festivals. Uh, it started out in 2015 as an uh, independent entity to be able to uh, share uh, equipment and infrastructure between events. So as opposed uh, as equipment that might be sitting in storage for over a year collecting dust, it can now actually be shared across uh, multiple events. And in the past, there also have been a number of events that had to um, exclusively rely on uh, demo pools from networking vendors. And uh, so Eventifra is a way to reduce the risk of uh, equipment not being available for your event. Uh, Eventifra is, uh, loans uh, both equipment uh, to events, but is also able to provide IP connectivity. And we do this uh, through our AS64404, uh, and we have a point of presence uh, in NICAF. Uh, good to note is that Eventifra does not actually uh, operate, operate the on-site network, and this is usually done by um, a team of volunteers. Uh, Eventifra purely runs off donations. It can be either in uh, money or equipment, and uh, donating, donating equipment is uh, quite a good way to uh, give your equipment a second life, so get in touch if you have anything uh, yeah, that is uh, old or uh, you cannot use anymore. Uh, yeah, and any anyway, equipment that uh, at some point we, we don't use anymore, we will try to uh, give it away uh, back to the community. Uh, the event infra stock over the years has, have, has maybe gotten a little bit out of hand because we have over 500 access points in stock, uh, 400 switches, 15,000 ports, 26 kilometers of fiber, and this is all, <laughs> this is all adding down to about uh, 7,000 kilos worth of stuff that is uh, sitting in our storage facility. So I hope the floor load in our building is okay. But <laughs> uh, yeah, Eventifra is uh, supporting uh, a number of uh, hacker festivals in uh, Europe. Uh, the, the most well-known ones are the, uh, the Chaos Communication Camp in Germany. Uh, there's the Dutch hacker camps uh, with the last installments being uh, SHA 2017, MCH 2022. And next year, there will be Y 2025, uh, held uh, at Geesmer Ambacht, uh, north of uh, Alkmaar. Uh, and uh, in the UK, uh, EMF, or Electromagnetic Field, is uh, being organized. Uh, these are all multi-day, non-profit, outdoor hacker camps, festivals, and conferences with up to uh, 7,000 attendees. Uh, there are presentations at big stages. Um, I have a pretty big uh, difference between the larger music festivals and these kind of festivals is that there are uh, all of the camping is mixed. So uh, while at these music festivals, the, there's a, a hard um, split between camping and um, all of the performances. Uh, at the hacker camps, there are also uh, lots of uh, art installations and uh, they, they uh, really shine during the night. Uh, here at the bottom right, I'm not sure if that's visible, but it's, um, it's a picture taken from a drone that was hovering over the uh, CCC camp in uh, 2023. Uh, on the top right is a picture, uh, aerial picture from SHA 2017 when it was held in uh, Zeewolde, um, in um, yeah, Zeewolde at uh, Scouting Landgoed there. 
Uh, with the network infrastructure at these hacker festivals, uh, we're uh, running a small-scale temporary ISP. Uh, it has its own AS number, IP space, etc. Uh, we're deploying an uh, on-site fiber optic backbone uh, with a local data center facility, and we're also um, providing co-location for some other teams uh, that are involved in, with the network uh, uh, at the festival. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the network is providing just uh, public internet connectivity for visitors, both uh, wired, wired and wireless. But it's also providing uh, private VLANs for um, different teams, um, such as uh, teams that are doing video streaming, VoIP, uh, IP DECT, ARTNET, ticket scanning, GSM, power monitoring, etc., etc. Uh, yeah, when thinking about um, uh, hacker camps, uh, the, the thing that usually first comes to my mind are the uh, what we call data enclose or data toilets, and uh, they are a relatively uh, cheap enclosure to temporarily house equipment in on a field, <laughs> and and it's. Um, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think it was uh, first deployed by the Germans, hence the German name, Datenklo, uh, at CC camp in 2003, but it was kind of before my time. And uh, 20 years later, uh, at the CC camp in 2023, over 65 of them were deployed uh, scattered across the field. Uh, yeah, if you want to connect, uh, yeah, the Datenclo is offering both uh, wired and wireless services. And uh, if you want to connect with your cable to the Datenclo, then you roll out your cable uh, to your tent and you place one end of the cable outside of the, the door, next to the door of the Datenclo. And then there is a, a group of volunteers that is uh, just running around uh, on the field, uh, passing by all the Datenclos and checking if there's cables to connect, and then uh, yeah, they will connect you up uh, to a switch, and the switch is sitting on the lid of the toilet in the, in the dating <laughs> uh, Yeah, And if you're lucky, uh, you would be able to get a 10 gigabit uh, connection if, you're, uh, if, if you support uh, 10 G base T on your uh, device. And uh, for, uh, yeah, for Wi-Fi, uh, there is a access point um, mounted on a wooden pole, and this wooden pole is, uh, is, mount is then installed in the quote-unquote chimney from the Dixie. Uh, and uh, yeah, the access point is uh, just a, yeah, it's just an indoor access point that is uh, installed in a plastic box. I also have a demo here, that's, uh, it's like this. Uh, it's indoor, ex indoor made outdoor, yeah. It's a very cheap way to make it, uh, uh, yeah, to get out. Because yeah, if you have to buy the, 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 the real outdoor access points, they are uh, like five times more expensive or something. Uh, and then at the very top of the wooden pole, there is a uh, device called the, um, uh, what we call an ohm light, uh, or an ArtNet LED sleeve. And this is a... Uh, I think Niels can like do a demo of that, but that's uh, yeah, it's the, it's that thing, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's like uh, yeah, it's the device that is driving these uh, RGB LEDs and it's receiving ArtNet data over the network and then uh, that is uh, generating this uh, animation. And uh, this sort of doubles as a poor man's network uh, monitoring. Because uh, yeah, if, if it uh, is disconnected from the network, it will just become a, like a static white light. And if there's no power, then it's doing nothing. So it's, it's sort of giving an indication to the, to the attendees of the festival if the data is it is it working or not. So that's, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, these, uh, uh, oh, yeah, these ohm lights are quite old by now because they were made for the hacker camp uh, ohm 2013. So they're 12 years old now. And there's actually a new version being made for the next uh, hacker camp in uh, 2025. Uh, yeah, the data enclosed, they're uplinked with uh, fiber optic uplinks, and we use these uh, armored uh, fiber cables. And uh, we usually attach them to the 400 volt uh, power cables that are laying on the train so people are not uh, tripping over them. Uh, yeah, then for the, all the, the, yeah, the fiber uh, uplinks of the data the, the what we want to achieve with this is that we give each data a uh, light path or a channel back to the core of the network because the on-site um, power or the on-field power is not always as reliable as uh, we would like it to be. 
So if there's any sort of power outage, then we are sort of reducing the blast zone. Uh, if there, so it's uh, maybe a power outage of one datum glow will only affect that datum glow and nothing else. At the earlier hacker camps, we uh, started off uh, doing this by using uh, byte eye transceivers on uh, multi-core fibers that are, we are sort of daisy chaining from datum glow to datum glow. And then in the, the last uh, two uh, camps, uh, we have been using uh, a new version of this, which is using um, uh, CWDM OIDMs, just to tie into Yuri's uh, story a little bit, and uh, where we are using a 40G LR4 transceiver on the core side of the network that was break, is broken out into four times 10 gig on different channels. And uh, I actually have this device here. It's the, uh, this is the uh, OEDM. We will have uh, one of uh, these OEDMs per datum glow, and, uh, and, uh, and it's uh, in a configuration where we have four datum glows that are in a ring, uh, and the OEDM um, yeah, has a, yeah, it's a east-west configuration, and on each uh, lag, we are adding and dropping one channel and in each datum glow, it's a different channel. So we have 12, 70, 12, 19, et cetera. And with this design, uh, we were able to also uh, add redundancy because each datum glow will have a 10 gig uplink and one over east and one over, uh, one over east, one over west. Uh, and this design is double the density over by die and uh, there is no uh, muxes required on the core side. It's just the 40G LR4 transceivers with the LC connector. Uh, we've made, uh, well, we've made or purchased uh, together with um, a manufacturer, Tallgrass, uh, 56 of these uh, muxes. Uh, then we also have uh, been using uh, Netbox quite extensively at these uh, hacker camps. Uh, the, uh, we're using it mostly for configuration, generation, and automation uh, with a tool called uh, IMF CFG, is that this, uh, we was, which was developed inside the hacker community. It's available on uh, GitHub. Uh, we'd like to pre-pan all of the uh, patches we want to do on-site uh, in Netbox because Netbox has a quite uh, handy cable trace feature. So if you're planning something complex with patch panels and muxes and whatnot, then planning this stuff in Netbox is quite useful. Uh, we have a few uh, Netbox scripts available that we are using to uh, populate the data in Netbox uh, for, for patch panels, muxes, uh, and those kind of things because it can be quite tedious if you have to do this, uh, if you have, clicked, have to click all these cables uh, manually in uh, Netbox. Uh, so with the data that we have in Netbox, we are uh, able to um, generate uh, printed patching instructions that the, uh, the, all of the volunteers that are running around uh, connecting things up, they can uh, take this paper and then use this as a uh, reference to uh, how they should connect everything up inside of these uh, datum clothes. Uh, lastly, there is also a um, Netbox script available that we uh, give access to to uh, other teams. And this is a yeah, sort of self-service portal for them. If they want to have a, a port changed to their VLAN, they can do it just through this Netbox interface. And then the configuration is deployed automatically uh, on the switch. And then I also have uh, some pictures. Uh, this is uh, Wi-Fi from uh, on MCH 2022 and CC Camp in uh, 2023. You can see here on the left, these are all these wooden poles uh, that are uh, going out to be deployed uh, on the datum close. Uh, yeah, last CC Camp we had a um, twin data center design. Uh, <laughs> that, um, well, on the left side, it looks okay uh, because it's like that was in the porter cabin and we had airco and it was all fancy. Uh, but uh, we sort of last minute decided like, hey, it would be nice if we can have a second location for, like we, we have a two core switches, two, two core routers and uh, two uh, uh, MX204 uh, external routers. We want to split them over two sites. And um, there was on this site, there was an ab ab abandoned uh, house available. And as it happened to be the most convenient spot to put the equipment in was in a bathroom. So, that, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
These are more uh, data, cent data center pictures. Uh, on the left side is MCH 2022. This was actually on a, a, as a fixed building on site at the scouting landgoed. Uh, so it's quite convenient to have those buildings already there. We just had to pop in some aircos and then, yeah, we were good to go. Uh, and at uh, EMF 2024, um, there was an uh, chosen to put everything inside a cooling container. So this actually is a container that is used to cool drinks, and it also doubles quite nicely as a as a data center cooling uh, thing. So, yeah. Okay, that was it. Now for the third and final presentation, we quickly switch to Andrew Yurchenko, who works for Cisco. Uh, he has a, a couple of uh, event networks to tell us about, actually. Uh, and then uh, we go to the panel with all three here at this table, uh, ready to ask all your questions or to discuss amongst them. I don't know. We'll see. Andrew. So uh, event networks is not my day job. In the day job, I'm lucky to work on open source. I work on VPP. But uh, event networks are my very passionate hobby. And uh, as Nick said, uh, I work on two networks that are fairly different. One, you probably know both of them. Uh, because one, one probably doesn't need introduction, Cisco Live. So that's probably about 10,000 attendees, about 16,000 overall devices pretty intense network in a sense that not just wireless, but also there is a lot of people connecting to ports all the time. There is a lot of uh, people making exhibitions, so they, they bring their devices, they need to connect their devices. And the scale of that network is about a thousand access points. We have about 500-ish switches. And as you see, well, uh, so th there is also the fairly dense, uh, high density uh, wireless installation. So for uh, the keynote, and that's what you see on the slide, uh, the number of people in a single room is about 6,000. So that's, that's pretty, well, sitting like you sitting, except imagine 6,000 people. So that's, that's pretty fun. And the deployment of that network, so the actual installation time is about two, three days. So it's a uh, it's pretty high intensity event. Uh, the other network is quite a bit different uh, because it is a charity event uh, which is held in Alps. It's called Alpzes, so it's a Dutch fundraiser for cancer research. Uh, and it is quite different in the sense that whereas with Cisco Live, which travels different venues and there the design constraints are kind of more dictated by the venues and the venues are designed for the events, right? Here, uh, we do some of the things that Ariane mentioned. So the network, so you see the track there uh, from start to the top where the knock is. Uh, the distance of this track is 14 kilometers and uh, yeah, the elevation difference is one kilometer. So we have interesting things like radio links, uh, and that's, that's quite exciting. Uh, and that's, that's the view from uh, the radio link. So you see the antenna, and the other antenna is uh, on that small spot uh, there. So you, you can barely see that. So that's a little bit different uh, deployment scenario. And here it is people coming for making the bike race, and people are more using ATMs, phones, video screens, and so on that are attached to the network. So it is much less dynamic environment in a sense of people plugging things in and out, except maybe sometimes plugging the phones into the USB ports on the switches, which is kind of unfortunate. Uh, <laughs> but otherwise, it's pretty relaxed. So, and kind of I wanted to distill a little bit some of the uh, post hoc uh, principles uh, that we arrived to uh, in terms of designing and what, what do we use as principles in evolving these networks. So first, composability. At some point, we figured out that, hmm, actually, we plan things very well, but if you ever did the event network, uh, then at least at Cisco Live, for example, there is always the floor plans that come already for this year. There are already floor plans, but the floor plans keep coming, and they'll keep coming up to a point where we're already on site, we're about to deploy, and then arrives Oh, sorry, this is the latest final, final, final version 10 
done. And that's probably not the last one. So realistically, you know that there will be always changes. And kind of we noticed at some point, well, it would be nice if we could rearrange things. And kind of that's the big question that we try to ask ourselves is at the access layer at least, because the diagram at the top is kind of the two, two data center design, two core design, so that's fairly standard, right? Uh, but the access layer is not even there, because the access layer, it's kind of kettle, right? It can change. And we achieved that by using DHCP for all the switch addresses. So none of the switches actually have static addresses in the network. So this gives a very nice flexibility is that you can take any switch, you can plug in any uplink port into any downlink port, the switch gets IP address for IPv4, for IPv6 it's linked locals, that's very easy. OSPF comes up, all the switches are in area zero, and boom, you have the routing. So address plan allows for 200 layer three switches, so they're all in the same uh, area zero. And currently in Alp2S, we use, well, all the switches are layer three, so it's kind of micro segmentation if you wish. Uh, and in Cisco Live, we have about 50, 55, depending on the event. Uh, yeah, and uh, I wanted to show as well the diagram. So the diagram on the bottom is the diagram of alp And as you see, it's pretty dynamic, so it's kind of organic. You cannot have the luxury of designing the network. You're more connecting the things where they can be connected. And uh, it was pretty scary first time I went there because at that time it was running flat layer two, uh, with VLANs, mind you, but it was still flat layer two. And when I counted, it was almost beyond the maximum radius for the spanning tree by, off, by a couple of hops. So, so that was when I said, okay, we'll move all of this to layer three, and now it is fully layer three routed network. Now, as I was telling about composability and the second part, which also uh, worth taking in mind is dynamicity, which is that not only things move in the topology, but the things also move in terms of people plugging in things where they may or may not plug things in. Uh, so first of all, what helped a lot was the fairly robust uh, layer two port config. So the layer two access switches, they have pretty much all of the security features uh, turned on. So. That's, that's one of the port configs, so you see it's pretty much anything we could turn on uh, is turned on. Uh, we do not allow switches to be connected to the layer two access switches uh, for obvious reasons, because then the potential for the loops is much higher, and troubleshooting loops in the flat network, it's uh, not great. Uh, so we, we uh, log down the config pretty well. Uh, another thing that we uh, kind of piloted the last year is, for Cisco Live at least, the deployment map. So uh, we have the software that updates uh, the maps that we pre-plan, where we put the switches, where we put the access points, and then with the automation tooling that we have, it dynamically updates where the switch was deployed, where the switch was taken away. If we replace the switch, that's also updated. Uh, so again, we kind of try to both pre-plan as much as possible because we really have uh, fairly little time on site, uh, but at the same time to be as dynamic as possible. And uh, in terms of, again, uh, changes, we kind of split the configuration changes into two parts. Uh, one part, which is the majority of them, is the service changes on the port. So I connect an access point, it needs to go in a special VLAN for the access points. It needs to have uh, multicast, so uh, both networks have fully functioning multicast uh, because we run TV, we run multicast for IPv6 uh, for the uh, wireless. So these types of changes are very, very frequent, and for Cisco Live, we do typically about a couple thousand of them. So obviously that's well, in the event like this, if you do it so fast, you kind of shouldn't have too much uh, process around that. So we just allow everybody on the knock. So anybody of those 60 people that you saw, they can go to the tooling, they can click on the switch, 
they can select the ports that they need to change the uh, service on, and that gets done. Five, 10 seconds is done. Uh, on the other hand, things like updating the access lists. They're a little bit trickier, right? Uh, as someone who have been dealing with the peaks and ASA firewalls for a long time, um, well, they can be tricky. Let's put it this way. And those who used to configure peaks and ASA firewalls, they will know. So for that, we have a little bit more uh, heavy process, but it's more uh, that then there is a person reviewing the changes. Uh, nonetheless, we still don't put too much paperwork on uh, the changes, but we put a heavy emphasis on logging and alerting. So every change in the network, every configuration change uh, gets logged. Uh, and even the inventory movement, because as I said, we have more than 500 switches and 1,000 access points. So they all go out, they all need to come back in. And the teardown happens in the span of a few hours. Uh, so for that, we had to come up with a system where, and you see me on that slide, uh, so each switch has a barcode printed on it, and the barcode has the MAC address, uh, and that barcode is scannable, so it's a little bit like when you go shopping. Uh, when people take the switches to deploy, they scan them, and when they come back, they scan them again, so we know whether the switch is out of the storage or whether it is in the storage. And yeah, how do you know whether the switch is in or out? Uh, with that, uh, we also have barcode for people as well. So when you take out the switch, you scan your own badge, and then you scan the switches. So we know who took which switch. And vice versa, when you're bringing the switches, we kind of don't care who brought the switch back, uh, so we care that it's in. So then you don't need to scan anything, you just scan the switches and then that sets their status as uh, uh, checked in. And again, yeah, there is quite a lot of new technologies uh, in terms of inventory mapping, but this, yeah, this, this is in place since probably seven years already and it works fairly well. So now this brings me to the topic of automation. And none of what we do would be possible without automation, so especially Cisco Live. And Cisco Live has, uh, the NOC team is composed of a lot of people who are passionate about this stuff because it's not a day job for any of us. Uh, so there's a lot of automation. There is, this event is opportunity to automate something more. So there is always more than one way to automate things. And we use a lot of open source, obviously, uh, but we use, uh, as I said, uh, we use the bespoke, Automation system that is, uh, well, I'm, I'm mostly written uh, or rewritten because I inherited it was in, uh, written in C-sharp and I decided to learn Rust, so I rewrite, rewrote it in Rust. And now it's 20,000 lines of Rust code. So uh, it works pretty well and uh, saves a lot of time. So with that system, we can track the inventory, we can track the reachability, we can do the configuration deployment, we can do the uh, service port changes. Uh, at the same time, we use it as a glue to uh, interface with the vendor products because after all, well, I'm working for Cisco, so we kind of need to show up, uh, show some of the uh, products that we produce and sell in the angle that is useful, right? So for example, the wireless uh, devices are primarily deployed because that's um, Cisco wireless that we use. It's deployed using the Catalyst Center uh, with deployment maps and everything. Uh, and the bespoke tooling interacts with the Catalyst Center doing the bidirectional syn synchronization of maps and uh, the status. So that allows both wireless team know about where the switches are, and it allows the team doing the deployment of the switches uh, to know where the access points are. So that, that creates a much better cohesion, which as you saw, there is about 60 people in the NOC team. Uh, so that's, uh, that's very helpful. Uh, and yes, I think that's pretty much it, I, what I had. Thank you, Andrew. 
If you would go to the table as well. Yes. Stay, stay around the table, please. <laughs> All right, so there you have it. Three ways of doing event networks. The idea is that now we let the guys discuss amongst each other or they answer your questions or both. Uh, one thing I took away is, is the difference in, in how to approach this uh, with Andre looking really like they, they bring their network and the network includes a router, it includes RPKI, it includes lots of NAT and it includes lots of IPv6 of course. And the other guys, they also bring the network but it's more like a wi wireless network. And I don't know if it's connected but um, Andre spoke half about, of his presentation about geolocation. And you guys didn't say a word about it. So I wonder if there's anybody who wants to, if you come a little bit closer to the table, it's better for the video. But if you guys want to say a word about geolocation, why, would it be important for you or not? Uh, no, so, this is working, yeah. Uh, yeah, at the hacker festivals, we uh, tend to use um, both temp assignment space and um, spa uh, just our um, primary space. Uh, and their geolocation is also an issue, so we also are using the same RFC. Uh, Geofeed. Geofeed. Yeah. I don't remember the numbers. 8805 or something. 8805, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, we use the same thing. Uh, yeah. We have, we have some, somebody in the NOC uh, who is very passionate about uh, geolocation can, as well. Can anybody check where we are now? <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe, well, with event infra, yeah, maybe we don't have this RFC 8805. I, I hear Amersfoort. Yeah? Oh, we are yeah, in Amersfoort. So, okay, good to know. Yeah, we don't use the RFC because it's uh, not ripe space and we don't have control over the object. And yeah, yeah, good. So, yeah. All right, I see there is a question from the audience. Julia. Um, mostly for the hacker camp, but it might be for all of you. How do you deal with your IPA space getting dirty? Because people like Cloudflare and Akamai don't need much of an excuse to block at a whole class C or more. Um, yeah, we do try to deal with uh, abuse email as much as possible. But uh, there is, of course, a problem is that we don't always know where the users are. And we also are not logging a whole lot of um, things in the network because for privacy reasons. So, uh, but yeah, we do, if possible, we, we would like to handle those abuse requests. And they, in the past years, they, uh, there's not that much abuse that we have, uh, abuse email that we have actually received. So it seems that people are not that adventurous anymore at these hacker festivals. But <laughs> <laughs> Boring. But uh, yeah, we do, we do want to be sort of good internet citizens and, uh, and handle the abuse requests if they're coming in. Cool. Thank you, Bob. I think there is another question there, Marijn. Um, it's a really short anecdote about problems with geolocation, and I think it was uh, event infra uh, uh, access points. Uh, where the scout event in Norway, uh, where on the last day before the event started, uh, they brought in the cheapest uh, payment terminals they could find, they, which were region locked to Norway. <laughs> we connected them to uh, the network, and they were like, no, you're in the Netherlands, so uh, we won't work. Uh, I think it was based on the MAC addresses of the access points. Uh, in the end, they had to bring other payment terminals because we weren't able to fix it within one day. Um, but uh, that was an interesting problem we yeah. came across. Uh, in two or three years, we will do the same thing in Poland for 45,000 people. And let's hope that we can fix it by then. <laughs> All right. Uh, for some reason, we have a payment terminal at Ripe Meeting that used to have Wi-Fi and the new generation has 4G. I guess it relates to this fact as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the, the geolocation based on the BSSIDs of the access points is uh, quite stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Okay, next question from the audience. Uh, I haven't looked at that site yet, so there you go. Antoine van Schuren, yeah. Basically, it's an extension to the first question. 
Um, when I look at the configuration of the networks, I don't see, or you haven't told us any bit about security tooling or security measures on the network. Uh, you know, to do security on a network, you have to know your customer base, right? Um, and, and of course, with, with these events, you don't know your customers because they pop in and you know them at the last minute. So can you tell me a little bit about you know, the security tooling that you do or extra security measures on uh, port configurations or stuff like that? I guess I can take that because I wasn't talking before. So we have a full-on security operation center. So we have four people doing security and only security uh, out of those 60. And uh, then using all the spectrum of products that exist. So um, yeah, all, all the extended detection response and all of that. So do you have, for example, DDoS mitigation systems and that sort of uh, like yes, so together. we actually have people walking and finding the people who are misbehaving sometimes. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, uh, both both on the IP level and on the radio level, because as well, if you have 6,000 people, you need to have very careful planning, even in 5 gigahertz, because we don't do 2.4 at all in that density. And uh, it's, it's funny because I, I even entertain myself once as well with walking around with the Mac and trying to locate the person who was broadcasting the society. It's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Next question, Tain. Uh, hi. Um, when you get to a random location and you want to announce your ASN, um, yeah, if I ring up KPN and I want to say I want to announce my ASN from at home, they say go away. How do you fix that problem? Uh, well, this is a different uh, type of contract in our case. So basically, we just have this uh, contract template saying, hey, we want your connectivity sponsor, and we want you to propagate our ASN with our prefixes that are listed here. So it's, it's not a KPN uh, home-based uh, connection. It's 10 gig <laughs> Ethernet link that is set up for us. But how Event Infra does it, I'm actually curious. How this event, for instance, is connected? What's the upstream here? Oh, yeah, so actually we are uh, tunneling all the traffic. Uh, so yeah. That's it. Uh, yeah, no, so the connection here is um, from, uh, sur from SurfNet. And uh, yeah, we're just tunneling everything over SurfNet back to uh, NICAV. So it's a very small hop. Yeah, and that's a way to, uh, to get connectivity as well. And we can do it like oh, with IPsec or WireGuard or what, whatever you want. Yeah. GRE, yeah. Thank you. Okay, over to the to my right again. Right, uh, this is primarily a question for Arjan, but maybe Andre and Andrew might have an interesting insight on this. Um, because Event Infra quite often ships crates of equipment to other events and all that, uh, how does how do you keep track of that? Or how do you, where do you store that? How do you log that? Uh, inventory system. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that might be, was, was a bit curious about if yeah. you have any, any specific insights on that. Yeah. Now, yeah, we do have some homebrew inventory system which we like to open source at some point, <laughs> or maybe rewrite and then open source. Um, but that, yeah, that's also like using uh, like barcode scanning, uh, and that kind of stuff, and then checking stuff into a location. Uh, uh, yeah, when you're loaning it out and when you're getting it back in. Yeah, pretty much the same for us with the slight caveat that we also, out of this thousand access points, about half or more than the half is borrowed. And borrowing them involves renaming all of them. And it also involves renaming back. So we try to keep really careful track of them. Uh, so yes, as a result, I now have all of the access points in Rai. Yeah, no we have the luxury of having uh, equipment basically just for ripe meeting. So it's either on ripe meeting or in the flight cases in the storage, and then it just moves here and there. So we don't have to really track the assets. Yeah. There is also a remote question, I think. Uh, actually, no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he just doesn't want. <laughs> Poor no. tone. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, he's uh, he's a bit uh, tied up there. So um, it all, uh, continues on the previous question. Actually, it's um, how many times does equipment get lost, taken out, not scanned, or brought back and not scanned, and um, or the returned equipment scanned that was not scanned when taken. So how do you deal with that? So. Return equipment that was not scanned, that generally, well, so it, it was happening before, so then you track it manually, obviously. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing that I found out is that 
Once we added the dynamic status of the equipment on the map, so the people who work in the field, so to actually bring the gear back and forth and who have to troubleshoot, then suddenly they understand why do they have to scan the equipment in and out. And that feedback loop was really cool because last year we didn't have a single case where somebody didn't scan out or scan in because they are, ah, well, then on the map it doesn't show as it should show and yeah, then I better scan it. So it's really about kind of making a feedback loop to people that they understand why they're doing the process. And that, that seemed to work really amazingly well. So that also means you don't lose that much equipment? The... No. Okay. Sometimes it walks away. <laughs> uh, but that's very, very, luckily very, very, very uh, small. And sometimes, it, sometimes what happens is that we put it too early. Well, we, early on we put it too early and then sometimes there is still construction going on. And yeah, so the compact switch uh, once went under a cherry picker and yeah, didn't survive that, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, we have an issue of forgotten switch in one of the patch room in one hotel sometime. <laughs> so sometimes this happens, but it was just our fault that we just forget. Uh, it, yeah, DHL is not always <laughs> very good at shipping things. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> well, it did not get lost, but it got pretty damaged uh, on the way. So. Now they should work on some geolocation protocol. <laughs> We have time for two more short questions, Arjen. Well, it's, it's more of an, uh, an anecdote from the security measures. Um, for, um, to get the law uh, servants happy for, um, what was it, uh, what the heck, we actually had to put in a snort box um, facing outward, so to protect the internet against the hackers. <laughs> um, we had to use snort uh, to look at the traffic going outwards, and that made the uh, servants of the law happy. Um, I think the snort box was implemented like three days into the event because we did not have time for it. Then it didn't take the loads. Um, we did some things with even an, an even MAC addresses to divide the load on two courts. And at the end of the event, it sort of worked, and nobody looked at it, but it kept everybody happy. Uh, in the end. And Thank I have a bunch of anecdotes about lost equipment and stuff, but I'll, I'll keep it with this. Thank you, Arjen. Last one, Sander. Yeah, um, when the, the uh, payment terminal thing with the geolocation was mentioned, um, I actually realized uh, I once had the opposite problem. It was an ITF meeting in Maastricht, I think, where they took the payment terminals from the US to the Netherlands. So. Um, I went to my hotel, I checked in, I went to the venue, I paid for the, uh, the meeting fee, and five minutes later my credit card was blocked because I did two transactions on two different continents within five minutes. 